My name is Nick Brax and I'm a storyteller who has dedicated my entire adult life to creating positive conversations around mental health. In recent years, discussions around mental health have become less taboo and entered the mainstream vernacular. I've delivered over 1,000 mental health seminars around the globe, including several TED Talks, and I believe we all have a story to tell. In my book, Move Your Mind, I cover my story and stories from people that inspire me, as well as insights from world-leading mental health experts. This book will help you to learn how to recognize mental health issues before they become a problem. Use your personal challenges as motivators, take ownership of your well-being, and create new daily habits that increase happiness and reduce stress. Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a mental health podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. On today's episode, I want to welcome Sasha Kaufman. Sasha is an executive with over 25 years commercial experience. He's worked at some of the best known global consulting firms and corporate brands before starting two of his own successful ventures. But Sasha's career was not without challenge. Early on, he lost his job through personal circumstances, which impacted his behavior at work. He found it lonely and difficult to talk about this, which in turn affected his personal and work life. In this podcast, Sasha opens up about these challenges and shares how his vulnerability saved his career and eventually led him to a crusade to help others to navigate similar obstacles. Today, Sasha is an influential leadership consultant and coach with a passion to help individuals, teams, and organizations navigate various challenges in life to live their most fulfilling careers. Sasha, thank you so much, mate, for coming on my podcast. We've, I've known you for a number of years. We've had so many conversations, so many times we've talked uh, behind closed doors or without a microphone. We've probably thought this would make a good podcast. And uh, it's great to finally have you on here. And ironically, you know, we're both from Melbourne and we're doing it while I'm in New York on the other side of the world. But yeah, thank you so much, mate, for coming and doing it. Oh, mate, my, my absolute pleasure. Um... I don't know if I'm jealous that you're in New York or um, whether that's not necessarily the place I want to be uh, in this crazy world right now. But uh, it's good to see your face, mate. And, yes, I'm glad I'm glad we've decided to do this because we've had some great conversations over the years, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like so, so, many, so many amazing things that I want to discuss with you and you've got such an interesting story and journey and so many, I guess, a lot of parallels as well in, in you know, what we've what we've been through and what we're sort of looking to, you know, do in in our careers. But uh, before we go into it, can you just for our audience, can you just give a bit of an abbreviated sort of overview on, I guess, who you are and how you got to where you are now? Yeah. um, It's one of the toughest questions when you, (laughs) when you throw in the word abbreviated, um, because I guess I've been working for 23 years now since finishing uni and, um, you know, for the last, 10 or so years, I've been a co-founder of now two businesses. Um, So I I, I became this accidental entrepreneur about 10 years ago after working in sort of global consulting firms and um, and global big corporates. Um, But I started in management consulting way back in 1997 or 98 um, and worked there uh, for a few years at a couple of different firms, Um, probably the most one of the most trying times of my life and I think that's one of the things that we'll we'll sort of talk about a little bit more. Um, Spent a few years in recruitment, uh, again, sort of moving around, really trying to find, you know, my my place and um, uh, I had a number of struggles early on uh, with that. And then a couple of significant things happened in my life, which, again, we'll, we'll, we'll go into, but really what I found for me, the calling was I loved working with people. Um, and I was fascinated by, um, how people think and what drives them from a career point of view. So that whole learning and development, leadership development, talent, um, space became very, very top of mind for me. And, um, that's the path that I pursued and, and, you know, I've had some incredible experiences along the way learned a lot myself and, you know, um, I I know that when I think about passion and purpose, it is absolutely that. It is working with people um, in the the manner of, you know, helping others realise what their passion and purpose is and kind of where they're sitting today and what the various blockers are and, you know, how to get there. 
So as I talk today as a co-founder of a, of a construction tech startup, I'm looking now to, to exit that role, um, get someone in who's much more passionate and talented and capable to take this company and to grow and scale um, as it needs to. It's a fantastic idea. But for me, it's a matter of um, returning to what is my bread and butter, what I was, what I guess I was put on this planet to do. Um, and I've been speaking to lots of friends and networks and everything, and it's very funny, um, but also really nicely reassuring that everyone's like, Sasha, you need to be in a role where you're doing this. Um, mm. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm sort of doing right now. So you kind of got me mid mid journey, mid transitioning journey, um, and it's exciting, but it's also very daunting because it's been a long time since I've actually been out there looking for for a role. Um, so yeah, interesting time. Yeah, definitely, and and I mean that's a, a point for anyone who's listening as well. It's like any any change is scary. You know, it's going to be uncomfortable. You got to you have to confront things. But that's the only way we can actually make those changes. And, you know, talking about passion, purpose, meaning, um, I'm sure we'll, you know, go into that um, in a lot more detail as we go through this. But there, it, it's listening to your gut. And often, you know, we we sort of intuitively know, but we'll ignore it because of that fear or the knowledge that if we do confront these things, it's going to come with that discomfort. So I love the fact that, you know, you're here talking about it you're sharing your journey. I think it's really interesting that, you know, you can talk about it as you're in this process because that's mm -hmm. like such a powerful way to help people listening. That, and I'm sure there's so many people out there that are having the same questions come up and wanting to explore that but not knowing where to begin. So it can definitely help a lot of people. Yeah, um, yeah. well, uh, look, uh, if, 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 it, if, it, if it can certainly help some others, you know, that's, that's fantastic. It's, uh, it's definitely an interesting time to be doing this. As I said, mm -hmm. sort of mid that journey and, uh, and, and trying to find for me exactly how to play and what that next opportunity is. Um, I know, I know, I've got some good um, crystallization around what I want to be doing. It's now what's the right environment, the culture, who are the people that I want to be collaborating with? Because uh, there's an incredible sea of people, yourself included, that we've talked about um, collaborating in this space. So. Yeah, it's very exciting, but like you say, um, pretty pretty daunting. Um, that feeling of being quite vulnerable again, you know, opening yourself up, um, talking about some things from the past, you know, around the journey that that were some really trying times. So it's you know digging into some of those those more difficult periods, um, but in a in a much more growth or healing way as well. So um, so that's also really good, you know, to think of where I'm at today from from where I was. Um, you know, the growth hasn't been a straight line growth. It's been a lot of a lot of jagged lines. Um, but nonetheless, like just some some real progress. And and that's what's that's mm. what's really exciting. But I think it's another another point. We're sort of taught this thing that, you know, in life you've got to follow this very clear set pathway and by a certain age and a certain point in life, this is where you meant to be and you meant to and it's just not how it works. And it also inhibits growth. If you live by that, then you might get to a certain point. I'm sure you could, you know, coast through and probably make an okay living and whatever. But if you're not taking this, if you're not listening again to that gut or, you know, doing things that are in line with what you really want, you're gonna limit your your personal happiness. You're gonna not be able to put your best foot forward and you're not going to be able to help other people. And, you know, it has a, a really, it has, you know, a huge um, sort of effect, effect in every way. So it's, mm. again, something where it doesn't really matter, you know, when or where, that, that's life. Like it's always cyclical. We have good times and bad times. And mm. I guess before we go into, um, you know, where you're going right now and some of these other messages, uh, you know, you talk about how your career sort of didn't start off, you um, in you know you had difficulties and you know things come up and a lot of issues early on in the career that you were mm. going through personally um, yeah. can you sort of yeah talk about that a little bit yeah absolutely and, and it's as I said it's something that I'm talking about a lot now because I'm talking about yeah. um, you know my career and what my story was and why I made mm. certain moves and and all that sort of thing so yeah it is it is very topical um I guess if I go back to my school days, I was a bit of a nerd at school. I was always a high achiever, did very well, um, you know, got into the uni course that, that or any uni course that I really wanted. And, um, and I did commerce arts at Monash in, in um, Melbourne. And 
um, again, just did very well at university, you know, became an honours student and when it came to working, that's where management consulting sort of became this thing. It sounded really interesting. It was project-based. There was a lot of travel involved and you were helping clients solve problems and, and that sounded very interesting for me. Um, and back then there was the, the big six as it was, you know, it's now the big four, you know, PwC, um, uh, KPMG, Ernst & Young and Deloitte, um, but there were a few more back then. And, um, you know, I, I'd done really well and I got offers from five of those big six. So it was like, wow, amazing. Wow. But at almost the same time that uh, I was finishing university and I got that opportunity to, to start working, my mum was diagnosed with a... Um, really rare form of um, lung cancer and um, and it absolutely crashed crashed my world and I guess mum was a single mother she'd been through a divorce um, she was working class she was actually a, a, an aged care and psychiatric nurse and it meant that um, her work was going to be impacted in that you know she was unable to, to perform her normal duties so um, I'm the oldest of, um, of, of four siblings and um, it just naturally sort of fell on me that I'm now going to have to play this role of carer. And in reflection, I mean, I just was not ready for that. I was in my mid-20s, um, just worked really hard at university and something, and I just, I just was ill-prepared for what that actually meant for me. And I guess... For me also at the time, and I don't know why, but there was just this shame aspect. There was this shame that my mum, who was so young, was was so unwell and, and you know, on, in this sort of mm. terminal pathway um, and, and therefore I, I really struggled and it's something that I found very hard to share and talk about with my friends, none of whom were going through. Thankfully, something is horrific. So I felt very alone and isolated in that. And unfortunately for me, the way that it played out so badly was um, that I acted out in my work environment. You know, I was in professional work environment, professional um, a pr professional space, and I acted out in all sorts of ways. So just to give you some examples, you know, um, I was travelling a lot for work. Um, that meant staying in luxury hotels. That meant going out for dinners. Um, so I was getting all of these, I guess, materialistic comforts at a time when emotionally I was getting no comfort whatsoever. In fact, it was it was really difficult. It was really hard for me to go home and have to be and play play that role. And again, none of this I realized at the time. This is all, you know, through years and years of counseling and reflection. On, uh, on what had happened. But, um, yeah, it all came crashing down for me. You know, I was, I was erratic at work. I was misbehaving. I was being cheeky. I was kind of being the, the, the larrikin, which was never me at school or university. I was, as I said, a bit of a geek. And, um, you know, after two years in my grad role, I'd actually been headhunted by another um, really reputable management consulting firm. And um, so I was headhunted to join. But had I not have joined, I think, you know, these guys were ready to say, listen, you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I joined the, um, the, the new firm and I lasted there only about a year. And that's when my world really came crashing down because I had exploited the expense policy so far. I was staying in hotels over weekends when I had also flown home, you know, so just charging the room. Um, I was out ordering expensive dinners and all sorts of things on the, on the corporate credit card um, when I shouldn't have been doing that because it just gave me that sort of, um, you know, that, that comfort and doing all the wrong things. And I take absolute responsibility for, for everything that I did at the time. And I got called in um, by the, the head partner and the HR person was there and they said, listen, um, we're on to you. We've seen what you've been doing. Um, we are aware of your, your circumstances with, with your mum, but um, unfortunately, you know, you've, you've breached our, uh, our, our policy and our code of ethics and so forth and we have to let you go. And that time for me was so incredibly scary because for me... I had my mum to look after and that meant financially too and I was now out of work. 
And the idea of telling mum that I'd lost my job or her finding out was just devastating. And I just, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So then the story that I told myself was I quit my job. I needed to, to, to do less travel. I needed to be home more. I needed to look after mum more. And that became the rhetoric. That became this lie that I lived um, to protect myself. So I, I look at it now as me armoring up and protecting myself and creating this story of that's, that's what happened mm-hmm. so that I could look after mum and, and take care of her and so forth. And that's when I sort of fell into recruitment and I was working in recruitment because I thought it was helping people with their career. But even then I was moving around firms because I was just being so disruptive and I was still struggling so much, feeling so incredibly isolated. And um, anyway, eventually in 2002, my mum passed, um, which was absolutely devastating. Um, Horrible day in May and I remember it. It was a bleak day. It was raining at the funeral. It was just horrible. Um, And for those that have lost you know, loved ones in their family, you know, despite knowing for three years, she had the cancer for three and a half years, knowing that it's going to happen still when it happens, it's just, uh, it's just the biggest punch to the gut. Um, so mum's now passed and we've gone through the funeral and I'm going through the morning. Um, and at that time, I was very fortunate that I had a very good friend of mine, Ben Gelber, who was volunteering at REACH, the REACH Foundation, formerly led by the great Jim Steins. And he just said to me, Sasha, I think you need to get involved in REACH. It would just be amazing. Come and volunteer. The kids there are amazing. You get such a buzz out of it. And I think you'd have a lot to contribute. And thank God I did. It was amazing. It was eye-opening. And I kind of went there to REACH with this mindset of I'm going to be there as a mentor and helping all these young people. And, mate, nothing could have been further from the truth. It was all of these incredibly brave, courageous young people who all had their own stories of challenges and hardship and sadness and loss and, uh, and, and abuse and so forth who were talking about it in a very open forum and sharing their stories. That inspired me. And it just was, like, incredible to see this, this braveness and, and, and courage so Reach was, was incredible. And through Reach, I found a partner who was working there, Sue Bannatine. Um, she was from PwC. And she said, Sasha, we've got a role for you at PwC. Um, I think it would be amazing. It's in our learning and development area. It's going to be a lot of coaching our young graduates, coaching our partner track directors. I think you'd be awesome for it. And I was like, this sounds amazing. So fast forward, I end up getting this, this incredible role at PwC. And still now when I look back, this is to, around 2004, so it's a, it's a long time ago, but still that role for me, roughly the two years that I was there, was the best role ever. I mean, I was in my element. I no longer had mum around. So now for the first time it was about me doing something for me and just about me and and I was flourishing in this role. You know, it really played to all of my strengths and I absolutely loved it. Um, so fast forward a little bit, two years in, I'm working in Sydney at the, at the time and I get called into the head of HR's office. Um, and um, it was a bit of a surprise and um, uh, Louise, her name was, sort of said to me, oh, Sasha, look, I just need to ask you a question. Have you ever worked at? A.T. Carney, which was, was the former firm that I had been fired from. And I just remember this overwhelming weight on my shoulders, like a house had come crashing down on my shoulders. And I just said, yes, I did. Um, like, where is this going? And she said, okay, will you let go? And I said, yes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, And basically what she said to me was, look, it had been brought to my attention by someone in the business community. You know, you work there. um, And when we checked your CV, AT Carney was not on your CV. And, of course, what I'd done is to protect myself was, you know, lied and covered up and removed that terrible part of my life from my CV. But effectively in PwC's eyes, you know, I'd lied and manipulated my way into the firm. 
And despite the fact that I was, you know, a, a really top performer and doing incredibly well, I had partners at the firm and even my immediate manager, et cetera, really standing behind me for, 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 for what I was doing at the firm. Mm. Um, after a few days, they'd taken what then was probably a, a harsh stance to say, look, um, on ethical grounds, we're going to have to let you go. So yeah. it's now the second time in my life for the same incident that um, that I've I've lost my job, um, and all of the self esteem and all of the confidence that went with it. Only this time, it was very different. It was very different through my experiences at Reach and understanding vulnerability and understanding, you know, the uh, learning the ability to, to put your hand up and say I'm not okay, and I need help, and I want to change, and I want to get out of this. Um, I was able to demonstrate my own vulnerability. And I remember calling my then girlfriend who was back in Melbourne, um, telling my friends that this had happened and I'd lost my job and, and I was devastated and I was in tears and I, and I just, I, I, I just, I was rallying. I needed help this time and I could see that I needed help. Um, I no longer had mum to protect either. As I said, it was, it was now about me and I knew that this was a pattern that I wanted to break. And um, it, the, the experience that I had and the growth and the learning was unbelievable. Um, the people that, that rallied to my support um, and listened to me and, and, and comforted me and cared for me was unbelievable and that was how I landed my next job, which was a really senior role in, in talent and leadership at ANZ. Um, I remember sitting down with the, the, the head of HR at the bank who had known me through to PwC and, and sitting there and telling him the truth. I'd lost my job. I'd been fired. Um, I'd lied on my application about, you know, this former incident. And he said, Sasha, you know, we... we <laughs> We, we all make mistakes um, and we've all got some, some things that we probably regret, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'd, love to, I'd love to explore working with you and I'd love to give you a go. And that was unbelievable. Like it was unbelievable for me and incredibly life-changing to get that experience. So, yeah, mm. that, was the, that was the early part of my career for the, um, the first four or five years. Um, it was incredibly challenging, but um, but also the start of something for me, you know, when through this tragedy of losing mum, having the experience of going through reach, seeing the importance of being able to talk vulnerably um, and courageously about challenges and things that we're, we're going through, um, I just saw how much support that that actually draws and that set me on the path even more so for what I wanted to do is go, well, if this is happening to me, this sort of thing must be happening to so many other people. I mean, death is just a part of life and that's only one issue. Yeah. But all these people that would be going through this um, where things outside of your working life naturally are going to have some effect, hopefully not as bad and severe as, as mine, in your, in your business life and affect your performance and affect your well-being. And, and that was the start for me. That's where I went. I, I love this work and I want to be doing this work forever. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and that's, that's why I'm, I'm still sort of doing it today. Wow. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing all of that. And I, I haven't heard all of that from you. You know, we've known each other for a long time, but some of that I, you know, we haven't talked about and it's yeah it's interesting it's a, a, a big journey I guess that's only only part of it as well uh but so many things in there that you know we could sort of go into and one of the keys like you're saying is I mean and I find it crazy that you know you were saying like when your mum was sick you were feeling this shame about talking about it and mm. uh, but it's it's another example of uh just vulnerability we struggle with it we're not taught how to do it I and, and a lot of the traits you were talking about in your story I've seen on, you know, living in New York, I've seen in extreme ways over here where you're meeting all of these people that it's just almost blank and they're putting on, you know, they're trying so hard and you can sort of see that there's something going on behind the scenes but 
it's all about um, external sort of using external things to, to hide away from whatever it is that's going on and it's just, you know, it, it doesn't end until you sort of have something so confronting that forces you to uh, look into that or um, you decide to make that change yourself but often people don't. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, all yeah. the stuff you're yeah. talking about, it's, it's so relevant and I guess, yeah, like is it something you in your time in the corporate world, um, did you see that a lot in other people you were working with? Does it seem like that's a big part of the culture there? I mean, I've no seen it. No, yeah. Doubt. No, no doubt. doubt. No doubt. Um, you know, I've I've made some real inroads with with, you know, so many people throughout my, my working life. Um, largely through, you know, you know, telling my own story a little bit, um, maybe in, in not as much detail, but you know, talking yeah. about the mistakes um, I've made, the imperfections in my career to date, and that has absolutely opened the doors um, and and given other people the confidence to go, oh, wow, you know, um, Sasha's not perfect. Um, maybe maybe I can sort of talk talk about some things around my own imperfections. And yeah. um, you know, there's definitely a, a mentor that you know you and I both know. He's a great Aussie guy, Ben Crow. Um, he's mm. someone that I look up to incredibly. Uh, he, he just articulates this so well in that, you know, we live in this world where there's this enigma, um, uh, this falsehood of, of, of living this perfect life and, and striving for perfection. And the reality is it just doesn't exist. What, um, what, 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 yeah, what is perfection? You know, what, what, is, what, is, like, what, what the hell is perfection? Um, you can't talk to the individual to the, to the side. You know, absolutely. You know, yeah. um, so the idea of making mistakes, of falling down and all that kind of stuff, we then create the rhetoric that that's bad. You know, making mistakes is just so bad and so forth. And, you know, there's no doubt that the mistakes I make, they were wrong. They were ethically wrong. I own them, et cetera. Um, but, but the learning from them and the fact that I made them, I'm, I'm a human being. And I think, oh, um, what, yes. what Ben says, you know, whether you're a, you're an elite performance athlete, you're an incredibly, you know, um, top of your game actor, um, you know, in the public eye, he often, often references people in the public eye because the perception is that, you know, their lives are great because they got money and fame. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, yeah. And that's certainly something that I realise is that, look, I keep making mistakes. I keep tripping up. Um, and but I, keep, but I keep learning from them. And I'm starting to, I'm not there yet, um, I'm starting to realise uh, and accept a lot more the fact that I, um, that I am imperfect and some of the imperfections are just innate in me and I'm going to have to accept those. Um, and there are others that are imperfect and that they're things that I can work on to improve, um, but I'm just never going to reach this, 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 this falsehood of perfection. Um, you know, that's, well, that's definitely yeah. gone, gone for me and, and, I, and I really like yeah. that. Oh, well, it's, I mean, it's just that's actually reality. Like what mm. the hell does that mean that, and there is no endpoint? It's like mm. we're, we're taught to sort of get to this endpoint, and then apparently things are all fine. It's not how life works. Like it's just this ongoing thing, and and we're going to make mistakes. Things are going to be good and bad. And uh, but you know, and even what you were talking about earlier in your story, I mean, you were going through some full on things, and you didn't have outlets for it. And mm. I think the behaviour was not really that extreme based on what you internally were holding on to. You, you know, you weren't giving yourself those outlets and. So, I mean, it's like an example of, you know, you're, you're human. Like, you can't blame. Like, we, and we're, we're so quick to label people. And if people do act out a lot of the time, it's like, okay, you know, if it's, if the behavior is wrong or, you know, someone commits a crime, obviously they need to be punished or, mm. you know, there's consequences. But also, you know, we don't, we don't take enough time to look into what is this person actually going through, what's happened behind the scenes. And, you know, a lot of it comes back to, you know, that preventative um, education and having these conversations and, you know, what you were talking about, trying to, I think this sharing stories and talking from that standpoint of vulnerability is um, one of the most powerful things we can do because people, yeah. you know, then they can relate and they can actually, you know, hear that story. They hear you, you know, someone in that corporate environment will hear you talk about it, someone who's actually been through it and done that. And they can mm -hmm. think, okay, if he's able to talk about this, maybe that gives me permission to then, be able to 
talk about it myself or, you know, yeah, go and yeah, help for you're, you're, you're right. I mean, the, the ability to talk about it. And, Nick, you know, you, you asked before about, you know, do I come across this with other people? And the answer mm. is yes, like countless uh, countlessly. Um, and, you know, the firm that, yeah. you know, I was let go from PwC so many years ago, I'm actually doing some work with um, some, some very senior people there actually on a, in a coaching basis. And it's really interesting because I'm doing, I, I, I sort of call myself a performance and wellbeing coach. Um, but when I'm engaged by clients who sort of seek me out, it's, it's usually on the basis of, oh, look, I've got a capability deficiency or I'm not performing at the level that I want to be performing. And this is in the business world. I'm not, I'm not coaching athletes or anything, um, mm-hmm. sporting athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a, you know, look, I, I don't feel I'm, you know, managing my team as effectively as I could or I'm just not building relationships with clients in the way that I need to to be driving more business. So that's sort of the their own diagnosis and that's what we start talking about. But then as we go through the process and we're having two-way conversations, you know, I'm talking and sharing as, as much as I'm asking of them, we realise that really there are some significant things that are going on in their lives that absolutely would be impacting on their capability and performance at work. And it's mm. not something that they necessarily saw in absence of our conversations. Um, and the majority of time that we're spending now is much more on the well-being side of what some of these critical, challenging, tough issues are that naturally are going to manifest in some kind of performance or capability deficiency. So it is yeah. it is amazing. Yet if I go out there and say, hey, you know, I want to just let's have a chat about your well-being and immediately deep dive into what's going on in your personal life, I probably wouldn't even get to, to see or meet these people. So it, it's funny yeah. still how, how it starts, but the journey is really going there. And the other thing too is if there's one good thing that's come out of COVID, it's the fact that well-being um, and talking about this sort of stuff, being honest and vulnerable, um, psychological safety is now at the forefront of conversations across the corporate landscape. Um, you know, companies have chief well-being officers and mental health officers and all that kind of stuff. The initiatives that are being introduced, um, the coaching that's going into leaders to be able to have these more effective conversations with their staff, which helps everyone. It helps performance. It helps ret- retention. It helps attraction of new people to that to that place of work. I mean, that is one really, really good positive coming out of COVID. Um, yeah. That's why I'm so excited at the work that um, I and you are doing is that we've been really, really trying to push and push and push this sort of stuff for a long time, but now it feels like finally there's a bit more of a pull um, and we're actually being asked um, asked to sort of step in and, and, and help where we can. That's so true. You know, people have... It is it's one of the positives to come out of it because people got were suffering so much that they couldn't avoid talking about it. It had to be addressed and it has it's just made it such a, a talked about thing. So I think on that side it's it's great, but there's still such a long way to go in, you know, quality preventative services like what you're talking about and giving, you know, high quality training and embedding that in, in corporate and um, you know, I've said it in so much of the work that I've done these companies. It's like they're like sort of mini versions of society where uh, they've been these cultures have been bred over so many years, so it's like you're having to chip away at undoing these, you know, embedded cultures. So it's like it's such a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a process. But this having that initial entry point and having them cooperate with you and be open to it, that that really does open the door to then find that way into to start yeah. chipping away. At yeah, it. you're yeah. right. It, it it is a process and it and doesn't happen overnight. But um, the the power of conversation, you know, and, and I saw it way back when it reached, you know, 2000, mm. 2001 um, with these young people, teenagers, you know, sitting in a room, complete strangers, didn't know each other, coming from all walks of life. Um, and it took that first person to have that courage to speak. And you'd see the lips quivering and they were shaking yeah. and so forth. And you now either talking about, you know, the fact that their parents were going through a divorce, which is so common for, for teenagers, or that yeah. um, they were potentially being being abused or, have some some horrific things, but how just that first person just created the the the, the safe space 
for others to follow um, and replicating that now more and more and more in our everyday working life is um, is, is is just reaping so many benefits. Um, and I know that, you know, in part today's podcast is um, in, in sharing my story is to to help inspire a lot of people who I know have also done a lot of reflection through COVID, you know, that feeling of, you know, I, I don't really feel connected or I, I don't feel um, like I'm, I'm part of something at this, this place of work and I, and I potentially want to make a move. And whether I know where that is or I don't know, I just I know that something has to change. But also there are some people who are also going, oh, but that feeling of being vulnerable again and putting myself out there and having to speak to people potentially around some challenges in the past, um, whether they've done things like me, lost their job, been fired, or it's things like suffering mental illness and mental health, that stigma is still there. So I really hope today, if nothing more, that, you know, again, my story um, shows that in creating that story and developing the narrative for you, accepting that we all have a story and we all have imperfections. I really hope that that helps and inspires people who are maybe a little bit scared to make that move and make that make that transition because they've got to talk about or reflect on some dark, dark places from the past. Definitely. And I'm sure it will. I mean, it will help. It'll help. I'm sure a number of people and, I mean, I always say even if, you know, this conversation helps just one person, that's that's totally worth it. You know, if you mm. can help one person make even a small change through us talking about all of this right now, that's that's huge. You know, that's mm. helping someone in their in their life and make a big decision or or guide them maybe to to you know making a better decision with us. Mm. It is. It's so important that we talk about it. Uh what what would you oh sorry, yeah, you're gonna I was just gonna say, Nick, like uh, where I mean but so many people know your yeah. story and certainly all your podcast listeners would know your story, but uh, have you ever really thought about like if you hadn't have been able to own your mistakes and and then talk about them from a growth and learning perspective, like where you would be today? I think, you know, yeah, it's a good I – I have thought about it. I think I there's a chance I wouldn't be alive, you know, if I'm really honest about it because I was on a pretty self-destructive path and – I was getting in life-threatening situations on sometimes a weekly basis and uh, I didn't know, you know, where to put my thoughts and I've suffered from or suffered from OCD and all these different things that I didn't, wasn't educated about as a kid, not, not because of bad parenting, not because of anything other than the fact, like we're talking about, no, we're not taught this stuff in school. You know, it's not yeah. part of society. You know, that's a whole other conversation where, you know, we need, which is like, like reach that you're talking about. I think it's incredible what they do because that is taking, you know, doing some of what needs to be long-term embedded in, you know, in how we learn. But like so many people, I wasn't taught that and I was on such a destructive path. And I think if I didn't confront it, I would have either imploded and gone down a very, very, you know, negative path and mm. I really don't even know where I'd be right now or, or maybe not be alive because I mm. just what was so unhappy. Um, so it was so important, but it was it was terrifying. It was the, the scariest thing. I don't have to remind myself that sometimes as well because to me now naturally you know, there's so many other things I struggle with, but I feel very comfortable just being open and vulnerable. And But I've, then I've, you know, done thousands of these talks over the last 12 years and, it's become second nature. Yeah. Uh, but that's a reminder for me as well to look back at that and remember I was, you know, literally vomiting before I'd talk in front of five people. Mm. And I'd be like staring at the floor, you know, mumbling and, you know, terrified. And I remember telling my, when I was, you know, first addressing some of this stuff, I was talking to my best friend at the time. Uh, she was the first person I told that I was seeing a psychologist and starting to address this. And I was on antidepressants at the time. And I was literally shaking and I could barely talk. And I thought, She's never going to look at me the same again. She's going to judge me. You know, I was terrified, and it was the opposite. It was like she was she she got it. She's like, okay, it makes sense. Your behaviour now makes yeah. sense, and yeah. she was my rock and guided me through it. And I had her there, and you know, like that's why that's why I'm so passionate about you know, yeah. talking about this stuff because yeah. I just know from that. But you know, it's it's a really important message that it is difficult to. It's not going to be easy to go and confront yeah. this stuff at the beginning. It's going to be really terrifying to try and show that yeah. vulnerability. But I think part of that message is 
it is it's like anything. If you haven't driven a car before, it's going to be awkward and difficult to, you know, you're not going to know what you're doing, you're going to need practice. It's just another skill to learn, really. It is. It's it's definitely a skill to learn. I mean, I think you touch on a really important point, though, and if I go back to reach, I know that one of the challenges of reach was that reach itself provided the safe space. So it gave um, those people, who, those young people who were challenged um, the opportunity to have people who showed empathy and wanted to listen and wanted to care. But outside of reach, a lot of those poor kids didn't have um, didn't have that support network. Um, yeah. In my case, you know, I, I don't think it requires, you know, heaps of people. It's not a matter of telling, you know, volume of people. But like you say, in, in your state, your case, just being able to tell one person that you can trust and you can be absolutely vulnerable with is is critically important. So, you know, yeah. there's being able to be vulnerable on one hand, but then there's having the recipient on the other, and and that's really important. And I think a lot of the people that I'm working with, fortunately, talk about having very close friends, close family, close colleagues, etc. But they're not really using them or leveraging them in mm. that way to be vulnerable. So that's um, such a good point. they've got the yeah. opportunity that they can do that. Um, but they, you, you do need the recipients, and like I said, at Reach it was, it was different. Outside of Reach, a lot of these kids were really on their own, um, and, yeah. um, and and their Reach was was that safe space, and that, that's so, that's so important. Yeah, no, definitely, and I think it's such a good point because you do see that you see sort of people that have so many people around them, and but they're very surface level relationships, and there's not you know you're not opening up that opportunity to be able to really talk openly and honestly. Uh, but I think on the other hand as well, you know, it's important that people understand. I had to, you know, find, I'm still finding a little ground with that where I used to just be too much of an open book with any, anyone on me and I'd get taken advantage of or, you know, just, it's, you've got to balance it as well. It's not saying you have to be open and vulnerable and bear your soul to every person, you know, you, you come across. It's finding that balance and having the people you trust that you can then go and, talk to and you know i think it's just having those you know two to three unconditional um friendships or relationships or whoever they are whether it's a family member a friend a colleague but having a couple of those or at least one where you can have that uh like you said i think it's critical for anyone whether you have a mental health issue or not if you want to grow and you know if you if basically if you're human i think it's important that you you do have an outlet like that in some yeah. you know way shape or form we, we've talked a lot today like again about vulnerability and and i'm sure a lot of again your your followers would know exactly what we mean by that but for those maybe that don't and think that vulnerability is about you know breaking down and just crying um for me it's 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 more than that and, and i have a, a definition yeah. that I, I take from Brene brown um who is again for me a, a real guru in um in, in this space around daring oh, leadership um yeah. she's she's just the best she's the most amazing storyteller but um, she talks about vulnerability as being having the ability to show up and speak in a way in which you have no control or knowledge of what the response is going to be, um, and that is a that is a scary thing to do. So, for example, um, saying "I love you" first to someone that you love and not knowing how they're going to respond back. It's incredibly vulnerable. It just leaves yourself open. Um, you know, talking about, um, for me, saying that I lost my job. I was fired for breaching expense policy, taking the piss. Um, I've lost my job. I've lost my self-esteem, all that kind of stuff. Not knowing if someone's going to sit there and judge me and berate me and tell me off or um, they're going to walk away or I'm going to lose the friendship. It's like that's what vulnerability is. And now yeah. I'm not saying that I didn't have lots of tears because I've been through that many times, um, but just that important distinction and understanding that vulnerability is talking about stuff that we know we find hard, we feel a bit sick in the stomach, we're shaking, we're quivering because we just don't know what that response is going to be. Um, and yet that's what people are naturally drawn to. And, again, I come back to Ben Crow. He talks about that. Um, you know, think about your closest mates. Think about the people you like spending time with. Why is that? Because you talk about things that are imperfect 
and that's what draws you together. Um, and 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 I just I, I just I just buy into and I subscribe to that so much. So um, yeah, just a, just another important about important point about what we're talking about there. No, thank you for sharing that. I, I love that, and I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use that as well to explain it in that in that detail. I think it is it's an important. Uh, message to let people know, you know, that's that's what it means. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the reason, yeah. The, the other reason I say it, sorry to cut you off, is um, yeah. I was running a workshop um, recently, so I do a lot of leadership stuff and I was running high-performing teams and um, had this female CEO who was a, an academic. Um, it was a market research organisation, very big, very reputable. Um, she had quite a dysfunctional team and there were some real issues and we had to have some courageous conversations. And... We got some really good feedback going into the break that oh, this is amazing. We should be doing more of this. These conversations are great. They're real. And the CEO turned around and said, oh, I don't know that we need so many more of these cry fests. Wow. And it was just this like, wow, you're the leader of the organisation. You're getting really good feedback about how important this is from your team, your leadership team, um, what they were getting out of it. And you've just labelled it this negative cry fest, um, and it was so so pertinent and so significant, and you could just hear a pin drop when that happened as we went into the break. So I had an offside conversation with her during during that break, where I just just sort of brought up, you know, questioned her on her language there and the impact that that had. She took that responsibility. She came back into the room and she apologised, um, but just that she had dismissed so much vulnerability in that room with one quick comment by calling it this cry fest. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating for the group. And yeah. it, took a, it took a while to sort of rebuild all of that trust that we've been working on um, for that day. So oh, massively. And I think it's, you know, in, in companies like that's, a common thing as well, because often the leaders are, they're, you know, they've often gotten there by developing this thick skin and trying to train themselves almost to be the opposite of being vulnerable because yeah. that's what we're taught will get you there. Absolutely. So, and then they're the ones that are, you know, then passing on all of these messages. Like you say, that's, if she says that, if you weren't there to intervene, that's the message that mm. they're going to take on. So mm. it's such an important point there that you're making. And I know we've talked about this um, before, um, outside of the podcast, how important it is that leaders in companies are really educated and trained like yeah. what you know, you're talking about doing. Because, yeah, yeah, look, I've worked in leadership development for, for, for many, 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 many years. I mean, you know, there's such a strong need and it's such a, there's such, you know, incredibly um, uh, available information around, you know, good leaders lead to great performance in organisations. Um, but even more so after COVID, you know, um, there are more things that we need to do to help our leaders. So first and foremost, we have to make sure that our leaders themselves um, are functioning okay. They have um, they have the support that they need. Of course, every individual has issues and things going on in their lives, often which we, we, we never really sort of find out. So we've got to make sure that our leaders themselves are looked after because if they're not, we can't expect them to be looking after and, and being great role models for the people that mm. they ultimately are leading. So that's sometimes the bit that we forget is first checking with them what coaching, support, help do they need to get them to the level of, okay, now you can do what is required of you to coach, lead, inspire, motivate, support, um, the people that you are that you are leading. So, yeah. um, um, you know, there's there's so many expectations on leaders. They're working with so many individuals. We need to build in the capabilities and, and um, the confidence for them to be able to ask the questions of of each of their team members. Um, but they can't do that until they have learned these skills themselves. And a lot of that is through talking, being vulnerable, um, showing empathy. They're the they're sort of key attributes um, that are critically important. And if organisations do jump in and go, right, let's go leadership development 101, this is what you have to do as leaders, this is how you have to support your team, without checking in with them first around how equipped they are, what's going on for them and um, for them to be able to be vulnerable and honest first, 
then we're then we're running the risk of um, creating a lot of damage down the down the line in the team. Massively, and you know, it's not it's no one's fault. It's not the leader's fault. They haven't had that education. This isn't yeah. something that you taught in companies. Going back to what we talked about earlier, it's not something we're taught in schooling. Parents don't teach us, so it's not one's fault. It's just something that needs to change. We need that mm. education, and and on that broader level, you know, we need it. So then they can bring that to the home. You know, these leaders can then, and then it, it fizzles down. You can then educate and change that cycle of educating your kids, and you know, passing that on. And it's sort of, it's got until the change happens in these different areas, it's not gonna. We're not gonna break that cycle. So it no. is. It's so critical that it, that yeah. it happens. Yeah, um, it sure is. A thing that I wanted to, you know, ask you, I mean, we talked about you know, purpose, meaning, those areas. What, what would you say to someone that is going, you know, really quite, like a lot of people are questioning, what do you, I don't, you know, I don't really know what my meaning is anymore. I don't really, I'm, I'm struggling. I, I, I'm, I'm confused. I don't know. I'm, you know, it's hard to get out of bed. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, if they're searching for that meaning and purpose, what, what would you say to them? Um... I'd say I know how you feel. Um, I know how you feel, and and it's really tough. So, just to selfishly bring it back to me for, for probably the last year, you know, COVID yeah. around the world, um, I think for everyone has been really, really tough. For my circumstances are that I live alone at home. Um, I'm not in a relationship. I don't have kids. Um, so, on one hand, that can be very liberating in that I don't have to support a partner and kids during what was an unbelievably trying time. For me, though, there were just massive bouts of loneliness, um, you know, being stuck at home, particularly during the hard, harsher lockdowns when early on it was pretty hard to go and catch up with, with anybody. Um, I, I found it really tough. And, and I think exacerbated for me was this realisation that I'd sort of kicked off this um, epic startup journey in, in, the, in the space of construction technology, uh, which is all just about trying to um, match blue-collar workers with jobs, so kind of doing this mm. talent matching, um, but kind of going, okay, this is an amazing business. It's an amazing idea. I've put a lot of energy, financial resources and everything into that early on, but now it's time to, for someone else to, to take the reins and to take that forward because... That's, that's not me. It's not what I want to do. I don't want to grow and scale this business. I want to be doing what I do. So, but that was made even more difficult during COVID. Um, and I think combined with just being alone and not having that sounding board around and that trusted person, you know, a partner maybe that I could talk to, the loneliness and the passion and purpose or the lack of was really, really trying. So back yeah. to your question, for someone who's struggling, I get it. It is a struggle. It feels awful. Um, not having a sense of fulfilment where I'm contributing something on a daily basis was tough and it, was, and it brought me down and it led to really depressive states and, and, I, and mm. I struggled with it. Um, but speaking to people who are doing what I love, you, um, Ryan, um, all these other people um, listening to podcasts, doing the research, um, reaching out to my networks and saying that I'm struggling, that's what helped me. Um, that's ultimately what helped me. So one was finding the clarity of what I do and there are people like you who role model this every day. Thank thankfully, you know, you share it. It's public podcasts. Um, websites, courses, that's awesome. But again, I had to be vulnerable and I had to go out and reach out to people and say, hey, this is the situation I'm in. I'm really down. I'm struggling. Um, I feel I'm a little bit lost. In my case, I knew where I wanted to go. So the help that I needed was how do I get there? How do I get back there? For other people, um, and it's probably even more difficult, it's the I know this isn't right what I'm doing but I don't know where I want to go. And yeah. that's probably even harder because there's a lot of soul searching that you've got to do. But in that regard, um, it's a matter of speaking to people that you know, like, and trust. Speak to your friends, speak to your colleagues, speak to your mentors if you've got them. Ask them what they see in you. How would you describe me? What do you think I'm good at? Um, 
Where do you see my eyes light up? You know, what do you yeah. think makes me happy? Start getting the the opinions and the thoughts from other people. Um, I found that in the past for me has, has really helped me as well. You know, I ask people, oh, say, yeah. if, could, could you describe who I am as a person or could you describe what I do best? And when you start seeing patterns there, that sometimes can, can really unlock it. So, you know, in summary, it's hard. I really feel for people who are in that position and lots are. Um, if you know where you're going to go, it's the get, getting help in how do I get there. If you don't know where you need to go, it's asking your trusted advisors what they see in you um, and, and doing your research, you know, what's out there. Curiosity is a word that yeah. I use a hell of a lot. Being curious. Don't be closed to anything. Be open to everything. Someone might talk to you about a role or an industry or a company or a brand or something you like. Heard of them don't want to know if you've got that closed mindset you're not going to learn instead going oh, well I've, I've heard of them got an opinion not sure how they fit tell me more it's a great great statement to say that tell me more um curiosity is is a is a great way to get out of this rut definitely i've seen it for me i've seen it for lots of people that i've been coaching um yeah so long answer to your question no, I, yeah, it's true. You know, curiosity. I think curiosity is such a good a good word for it because as soon as you, it's amazing. Anything you want to do, you can you start at point zero, and you just start talking to people. You don't have to necessarily have the perfect person to talk to. You just start telling, asking people, talking to them. It's amazing how quickly when you do that, doors start to open, or you you know the idea forms, or you find okay, actually, I didn't even think of this, but this person randomly suggested this thing, or like you said, they saw this thing in me. And then you realize, oh, actually, maybe I'll look into that. And then that leads to another thing. And, yeah. you know, it's like a snowball sort of thing. And I think, you know, the one thing I say, whether it's with mental health or anything, there's one thing, only one thing that we should not do, and that's doing nothing. If you sit there and do nothing, you you know, you, your, your thoughts fester and uh, they compound and they become yeah. worse and you get in a deeper and deeper hole. So just the one thing is just don't, don't do nothing. Do yeah, something. Absolutely. You know, whether it's even... It's just taking that. This is the first step, is and it's yeah. not hard, but the thought of the first step's hard. You know, it's always thought of the first step's hard, and I, and I think again, it, it's a it's a classic example of how to do this. The best way to do it is to be vulnerable, and what I mean by that again is that sometimes it, it, it's going to feel awkward to go it, it, asking for help. Sometimes we, we we don't like doing it. You know, we feel stupid. Um, you know, go and work this out for yourself, kind of thing. But that's not actually the case. Vulnerability, if you can be vulnerable in a really authentic way, and in this example, hey, can I speak to you? I'm feeling really lost at the moment. I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm not happy with what I'm doing. And I'm really struggling to work out what I want to do. I'm really struggling to work out what my purpose is or what the right role is for me. Can you help me? People have an innate desire to help oh, others, um, particularly when it's done in that most vulnerable way, you know. Um, think about people that, that you've helped uh, in your life, you know, when they've said, I'm struggling and I, can, you, can you help me? I mean, you just, you just, you just naturally want to. I do mm. too. Um, mm. And I've seen it, same thing for me, when I've reached out and said, you know, I'm struggling, I'm lost, I'm feeling really down at the moment, I'm lacking fulfilment, I'm lacking a sense of purpose, um, I'm looking for some direction, can I bounce some ideas off you? Can we go for a walk? Can we have a coffee? It's incredibly powerful. And, again, that's a really good example of what I was defining before around what being vulnerable is. Um, you don't know yeah. what the response is going to be. You don't know if they're going to go, oh, no one has. I can tell you that. No one ever has um, because, thankfully, there is an innate kindness in most people and when done in the right way, people will go, let me do Let me see what I can do. And if I can't do it, let me find someone else who can. So, yeah, that's that's really good. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. You know, every, I've, I've had, had the same. I haven't ever had anyone say no or you know if, like you're saying if, if not they'll 
fight directly to someone who can. And that I've had, I've been so fortunate. I've had so many people, and I have so many people around me that um, have been able to offer me support and help. And I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't survive without that. And on the flip side, um, it, you know, when someone does ask for help, it's, it, it, it's, it is that natural instinct to want to help. But it makes you, you know, and I always say for that, you should look at that and, and tell yourself, I want to be selfish in helping other people. Because it makes, you know, if you look at it, it makes me feel good as well. It's going to make you naturally want to help more people because it does. It makes, I don't think there's anything, uh, I guess it's why we're having this conversation, you know, I, I haven't found anything that makes me feel better than just trying to contribute and do work in this area, uh, you know, because it's, it, it feels genuine. And mm-hmm. if it does have that impact where you just see one person that took something out of it, it makes yeah. you feel good, you know. Oh, like definitely. It's, Definitely. So it's like it's yeah, it's a good way. I mean, that's it's 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 you know, it's largely why I do the work that I, I love. I love seeing the impact. You know that um, some of the stuff that I I, I talk about um, can have an impact on on other people. Um, I, I you know I definitely feel good about it. But it's 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 you know it, you got to be careful too around the you know that that gratification. Um, you know I love the idea of. Um, speaking to someone and, and helping them through a, a particular challenge and seeing them come out of it, um, I feel fantastic when I do that. But I leave a lot of the action up to them. So I can sort of say, yeah. you know, talk about suggestions or talk about, you know, what I do or maybe what I did and that what worked for me. But, you know, now it's up to you. And like you said before, it's about action. Yeah. You can't just sit sitting on your hands and hope. Um, so the action and the effort and everything has to come from you. Um, yeah. And then getting that feedback of, yes, Sasha, I got, I got this job or I've just found this new opportunity or I've rebonded, you know, my, my, my relationship with my mother, my father, my, my best friend. That's just like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yes. I love it. And I think yeah. you're right. You know, people, people do love that. Um, they love the ability to help. But it's really important to be able to do that, to ask for help. Um, authentically and, and vulnerably, and that's where you'll get the best response from people. Yeah, and 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 like you said, you know, it's guiding people and and giving them that support, but also not telling them how they should do it. I think that that yeah. was a really important point because, and and you know, you see it um, everywhere in this industry as well. You know, like a, a Tony Robbins type thing where it's like, you know, do this or follow my twelve step formula or go and mm. scream and chant and. And then everything's going to be better if you do that for three days and pay all this money to do it. And it's like, well, no, it's like you can't, everyone's different. So you, you've got to guide them and try and direct them to the right information or, yeah. you know, let, give them the tools to be open to then make their own decisions about what to do next because yeah. everyone's different and we're all got different ways that we learn. And, you know, um, there's just no one set formula for how to do it, which I no, think is so important. No, absolutely. 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 Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm seeing lots of people right now who are asking the question of themselves, you know, what is my passion and purpose and um, do I need to make a change? We hear things um, in the media called this great resignation, which we largely are seeing coming out of the US. Lots of people voting with their feet, um, you know, it's this expectation of 40% are highly likely to leave their jobs within the next 12 months, which is a massive thing, and many of whom yeah. are, are willing to do so even without the next job to go to, but just this is right. not right, um, this is not good for me. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is huge right now. So mm-hmm. um, great that people are thinking about it more, passion, purpose, because it's such a phenomenal driver for fulfilment in your, in your life. Um, but still, it doesn't take away that, hey, it's still hard. It's still scary. Um, it's a, it's going to be a vulnerable time in your life. But mm-hmm. if, you, if, you, if you effectively use the support crew that, you, that many of us have and are fortunate to have, um, it can make the journey a lot more, uh, a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot easier. Oh, yeah. It can make the journey, yeah, so, so much easier. And it just, mm. it's critical, I think, to have that support. No, no one can do everything on their own. It's just, mm. it's not possible. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I could talk, we could probably talk about this stuff all day <laughs> and go into much more detail. We might have to do a round two of this. But um, yeah. I, we, we sort of have closing questions that we finish every episode with. But before yeah. we go into that, um, are there, just for the listeners, are there things that you personally do 
in your day-to-day life that help you just with your general, you know, well-being or, you know, for me, it's exercise, meditation, um, having those unconditional friendships, you know, are there things that you do that you could share with our listeners? Yeah, um, there absolutely are. So as I said, you know, the last 12 months in particular has been a really, really tough time. You know, I, I, I felt very isolated, um, bouts of loneliness, but just this lack of lacking purpose and, um, and, and passion. And so I'm on this journey now. I know where I want to go and I'm having lots of conversations again with the big four consulting firms mm. where I really want to be doing this kind of stuff on a, on a, on a permanent basis and some great opportunities um, uh, are, are there. But on a daily basis for me, similar to you, I need, I, I know that I feel better with exercise and sometimes it's hard because I'm having an off day um, and I have to grip my teeth and do it, but there's no doubt that every time I've finished, I feel, I, I feel so much better. Um, the availability of podcasts and listening to things to kind of go, hey, I'm not actually alone in this. You know what? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great podcast, and I hope I, I hope it's okay to plug it here. A um, good mate of mine, Ryan Shelton, um, and and his um, uh, co-host Hugh. Uh, run a podcast called The Imperfect and they have some amazing guests on there and they talk very real and vulnerably um, in the way that I guess we have today. I listen to that and, and I just it just reminds me that we're all in this and we're all we've all got cases of of, of imperfection. Um, it's just who yeah. we are naturally. So it's okay. And I, I really listen to that. I'm trying to spend I'm trying to spend less time on social media. And I find that if I start going through the flicking, the scrolling kind of thing, that's an opportunity for me to actually learn something. So that's where I'll go to an audio book. Um, there's a great app called Headway right now. Um, it's a paid app, but I think it's well worth it. It's about 80 bucks a year. And it's curated books around all sorts of topics from health and well-being to fulfillment to joy to happiness um, to business success and so forth, rather than reading or listening to the whole book, you get all this curated content, you get the key insights from each and you can choose to mm. listen or read. So I'm doing that from the point of view of I want to be learning something every day and I've really, really enjoyed that. I've only been doing that the last couple of weeks but I'm I'm already religiously into it. Um, I love that. And like a lot of people, I've probably stacked on a couple of kgs during... COVID, um, for those in the US, that's a lot more pounds than I um, that I would be normally. So I'm, I'm really trying to eat healthily. Um, you know, that's lots of lots of vegetable salads, way more vegetarian meals, um, and that's giving me a, a sense of um, a lot more vibrancy as well. It's still early days, um, but that's that's something new that I've introduced as well. So yeah, there's that's a couple cool. of things that I'm doing. No, there you go. And I'm, I'm going to take on, I like what you said with the social media stuff because that's for me, you know, I, I talk about this stuff but I fall into that in a big way still where you're just, you know, you're scrolling through and you're looking at all these random things. But I like that strategy of when you find yourself doing it, it's like, okay, if I'm going to spend time using technology, why not right now go and actually listen or look at something that's going to educate me? I think that's um, really good one. If, if I can, Nick, there's a, there's a, yeah. a leader, one of the leaders that I admire most, um, not sure if everyone is into Formula One sort of Grand Prix. I've only gotten into it recently through Drive to Survive, but I'm now pretty obsessed. And the Mercedes-Benz team principal, his name's Toto Wolf. Um, he's an Austrian guy. He sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he's just amazing and inspiring. He talks about, you know, social media. Uh, social media for him feels like he's putting his brain into neutral. And it's just numb. So he doesn't use it at all. He hates it. But he's also so disciplined and he tells this story where he flies all over the world, obviously, for all the races. And, you know, from the Melbourne Grand Prix back to Europe is a 24-hour flight. He actually sits on the flight, um, doesn't turn on his phone, will not watch a movie, doesn't read anything, and he stares out the window and just reflects. And for him, he's like, it's like plugging my laptop in to the power socket overnight and mm. recharging my battery. He's like, mm. that is a luxury for me to be able to do, to get 20 hours with no distraction. Um, he just eats and stares out the window and thinks and reflects. 
And I just found that so incredible. Now I am so far off that level of discipline. It's like, it's, it's crazy. But to me, it's still unbelievably inspiring that he could, that, that someone like that can do um, something like that. I just think, I think he's, I think he's amazing, but it came, that just reminded me because it came from the story of social media where it just talks about yeah. he doesn't like his, his brain being numbed in neutral, reflective, yes, but not numbed in neutral. So, um, yeah, that, I just think that's an amazing story. Uh, no, thank you for sharing it. I love it because it's, um, it's an example as well of someone at that level of success you know, how you can, you still can benefit, you know, you, you're taking that time out and we think that, you no, know, we don't have enough time or if you want to be successful, you need to be doing things nonstop and our brain's actually not built to do that mm-hmm. and you are going to be able to make much more informed decisions if you give yourself that break and you're not constantly consumed with, with information. So it's just, it, it is such an important yeah. thing. So, yeah, and we don't, so, yeah, we don't, we don't have to be on 20-hour flights to be doing that. There's no way. I mean, no. there's so many places that we can go to, um, you know, meditations, something like that, where we just yeah. sit and, you know, cl- close our eyes, open our eyes, whatever it is, and, and think and reflect and kind of free the mind. I must admit I'm not a great yeah. meditator. I've, I've, I've always struggled with it. But um, something I would love to be better at because I do find it hard to shut off my mind. But to me, that's just like one of the most epic stories mm. of discipline mm. uh, and focus. So, yeah, he's, he's an inspiring amazing. guy, that's for sure. Whether you like F1 or not, he's an amazing leader. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, mate. Um, mm. So these five final questions, these can yep. be um, just quick answers, whatever comes to mind. Apologies um, for my droopy mic today. I've been fixing this <laughs> a bit. No problem, mate. Go What's to sleep on Um, so yeah the first one is what's the the best childhood memory that comes to mind um geez that's a tough one um or one yeah one of them the best childhood memory that comes to mind um I've actually got two and they're both around they're both around life or death moments would you believe so um, the first one is I nearly died. I nearly died at about eight years old. You know those little cheese and bacon balls? Um, and I had like a mini, pa- yeah. mini pack of those. Um, I, I loved those as a kid. And, and I had a sister who was three years younger than me and just the two of us were, were home. It was like an after-school treat to come home and get, you know, one of those mini packs of chips. And I remember tilting the packet up Um you know, to, to tip the last few in and it got stuck in my throat and I actually started choking. But my sister who was looking at me, she thought that I was laughing. I was like pulling faces. I was like this. Mm-hmm. And then she just says, you know, she, she, I, I turned blue and she, um, she, just, she just panicked and she went into this instinctive mode. She would have been five or six years old and she started like, grabbing me, punching me, etc. Anyway, she just she just came from behind and, and squeezed me. Not like the full Heimlich maneuver that I think you're meant to do, but she she just she grabbed me. And I don't know how she knew how to do this. And this cheese ball popped out of my throat. Wow. And had she not have done that, I don't know. I, I could have died. So I re- I remember that so much, almost at such a young age, thinking, I'm gonna die here. I couldn't breathe. And 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 I and I came to and I and I survived. So she saved my wow. life. And then I also did it for her. It was winter. We had a beautiful pool out the back. Um, she was younger, and she was fully clothed in like winter jackets and like a furry thing and whatever. And she fell in the pool, and it was just me. And it was freezing cold. And I jumped into like instinctively fully clothed, jumped into the pool because I just saw her sinking and, and brought her to the surface and and saved her life. So we were one one. This is probably the weirdest wow. answer that you've ever got to, you know, favourite <laughs> childhood memory. But but just this life or death instinctive love care reaction for for my sibling, I just think is it's just it was it's really it's really memorable for me on both occasions. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Weird wow. one. Haven't talked about that in such a long time. But but 
just amazing memories of, um, yeah, what we do instinctively um, in, a, in a positive way. Thank you for sharing it. And I can't believe it, yeah, five or... I can't believe that was my answer to your that, question. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a different one than we've had, but mm. I love that. But it's like, it's crazy at that age, you know, instinctively to yeah. have that reaction to go yeah. and do that. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Um, what do you think is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society? Or again, one of them. There's many, so yeah, maybe one of them. Um... There are a number. Um, look, I, I, I might take a different tact again in, in answering the question. I think um, I think there's such a positive side in coming out of COVID, where so many people really did suffer um, through in, in so many different ways. It, it affected everyone so differently. Um, but now mental health and well-being has gone from something that was taboo, hardly talked about, still this negative stigma to it is absolute high-end priority. I'm going to weekly seminars and sessions run by the great consulting firms and um, all sorts of companies, amazing guest speakers, people, again, that you would never have known had these issues and challenges and um, mental health issues themselves, openly talking about them. So for me, for me, it's just going to be time. It's happening. Um, it's, it's, it's turning on its head in a really, really positive way, but it's still just the beginning of the process. So I guess the, the burden is time. Yeah. But the time that we have now, I think, is going to be used so much more constructively, and that's unbelievably exciting so Which you, you, you yeah you just answered the next the next um the next question which is you know do you see things sort of over the next you know 10 20 years improving which um clearly you know you do yeah um, i do I, 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 I see them i see them improving and obviously we're just coming out of the pandemic um so i hope i hope very much so that this is not just a momentary thing where we go, look, you know, it's been a hard couple of years. We focus on this just for a little bit and then we go back to normal where we sort of bury it again. That's that's a risk still in my mind. So next 10 and 20 years, I just hope that it does go up and up and up and up and up. Um, yeah. Performance and well-being are incredibly intertwined. When we talk about company performance, you can't have good company performance without really good health and well-being of, you know, the people who are in the company. But, you know, that, that is just that just yeah. goes hand in hand. So I hope yeah. it continues to build in momentum rather than it's just uh, at the forefront right now and it slips. That's potentially think, risk. Yeah, and I, I think it will. I think it'll be the kind of thing where it will slip a little bit, but I think the people that say doing it will be the people that really do, you know, care and are doing it properly. So it's sort of, yeah. I think it, it will trend in that way. Um, so two more questions here before we, mm -hmm. before we finish up. Um, what would you say is your personal definition of happiness? Geez, you're asking really good questions, Nick. Um, and clearly you can see that I'm, I'm unprepared. Hello, Storm. Got, got the, the dog here um, to help you out. <laughs> Yeah, look, for, 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 me, for me, happiness is um, a, a feeling of fulfilment. <laughs> happiness, happiness is, is, a, is a dog. Yeah. The dog, this beautiful, beautiful canine licking my ear. Um, no, for me, it is. Pa pa passion and purpose, um, definitely. I, I know that I am at my best mentally. You know, my mental health is at, at its best. Um, I feel physically good. I feel energised when I am doing something that I love, with, which is passion and purpose. And sure, I do, you know, leadership development and stuff for work, but I do this every day, you know, with my friends. Um, and for some of them, it's still confronting and, you know, some love it more than others. But, but I, have a, I have a smaller group of friends these days, but a very tight group of friends. And, yep. you know, whether I'm working and I'm being paid and stuff 
to, to do this kind of stuff or I'm just having really good, deep, real conversations with my friends, I, I, I'm, I'm fulfilling my passion and purpose and I, and I feel... I feel incredible, uh, yeah. and, and so that's 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 what I love. Um, and there's no doubt that good mental health and physical health is critically important. You know, I'm in my mid forties right now, and I've got to get all sorts of tests and checkups. Um, and I I really value and I respect my health a lot more than what I probably used to. Um, and and I'm very conscious of that. So being fortunate and grateful for being in a in a good healthy space right now, but ultimately doing what I love with, with people that I love and care about. And you look good for you, for, for where you're at, mate. You look, you, you definitely don't look in your forties. You, you've thick. still got, got the thick head of hair and, you know, thick the, head of hair. No, <laughs> two, two, two grays so, on the side. These are my COVID grays. Looking good though. Looking good. So I'm, I'm hoping I can, you know, age as well as you. Oh, have, mate, which, I don't uh, think you got a problem the head, with the hair how you're going to age. Good. <laughs> your dad still looks. Your dad still looks a million bucks, and you are a spitting image of your your old man. So there you go. Uh, you got good genetics, don't you worry? Should be okay. Um, All right. Questions. What's this last question? So, most courageous thing you've ever done? Um, oh. Um, two, and I won't go into detail about the first because we talked about it. The yeah, telling people that I'd lost my job and and you know my whole bravado and my image and my self esteem just collapsing before me. That 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 was one of them. Um, and the other one was 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 coming out sexuality. Um, I was twenty nine when I when I finally when I finally did it. Um, you know I, I fell in love and, and that's how it happened for me. Um, and I'd known for many years before, but finally it happening, um, mm-hmm. and telling people, you know, one by one and seeing the joy and the, 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 the celebration and the immense happiness, you know, um, from, from other, from, from those people that I cared about, because I felt like I, I felt like I was lying for, for so much of my life and, now I was being very truthful and, and revealing something. And, again, it was vulnerable because I didn't know how people were going to react. Like, okay. whoa, okay, um, don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Um, you just you just didn't know. Um, my dad in particular was someone very hard to tell because I just, you know, just comments that he'd made over the years and things made it, made it pretty challenging. So, yeah, um, telling my story at that particular time in, in my life was when I felt like, oh my God, this is so hard. I, I, I was I was shaking. I was shaking. Yeah. You know, sitting down with mates, taking them to dinner. I remember the very first person I told, um, you know him, Shura. Oh, yeah. we'd, we'd gone out for pizza and we were sitting there at the pizza restaurant and I was hardly talking. I was hardly eating and all that kind of stuff. And it was ready literally at the end of the meal. He goes, all right, so should we go? And I hadn't even said it yet. Um, and then I said it and it just felt so relieving to do so. Um, it was, it was amazing, but it was a, it was a really, it was a challenging time in my life, but ultimately incredibly rewarding. And again, rewarding through being vulnerable, you know, yeah. so rewarding through being vulnerable. Which, so, which I think is a great way to, you know, finish up as well, mm-hmm. tying back into the vulnerability. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, thank you for being so open and uh, sharing all of this information, which I know, you know, will help so many people. And I've learned stuff about you that, you know, we haven't um, talked about before as well. So it's been great. So I really appreciate it. If uh, we'll put and, – and is there – if people want to learn more about you, where, where can they go? Um, they can um, so LinkedIn's a, a, a great great place for me. Um, LinkedIn yep. um, or at Sasha Koff on Instagram. Um, more than happy to to meet connect. Um, uh, I, I, I love doing that. Um, but yeah, Sasha Koff, and I'm sure you'll share my details and we'll put, we'll put it in the, all in that the show notes. Stuff. Um, no, we'll we'll have yeah. all the links. Yeah, your LinkedIn and yeah. the show notes. For you. And mate, thanks to you. Thanks for everything that you do. You've been in this space for for 10 years, um, pushing shit uphill early on when, um, when people didn't respond well to this and yet you were so determined. 
um, and to see what you've done now and how many people you've helped through telling your story, through bringing in other people, through helping other people open up and, and share, mate, you're, you're a testament. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's an honour to be, to be part of this and to be collaborating with you, mate. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to be part of your incredible journey. I appreciate it, mate. Thank you and appreciate you coming on. And, you know, you've been one of those people supporting me along the way. So thank you to, to that as well. My oh, man. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, mate. It's been Thanks, great. buddy. Good to awesome. see you, mate. Bye, Nick. You too. Thanks to Sasha Kaufman for joining me today for Move Your Mind. And just another reminder that the Move Your Mind book is now available globally. You can get it in stores in Australia. You can get it online globally. And the audio book is also now available globally.